Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Caitlin Saposi Belknap. I'm moved to Amends National Director, and I am speaking to you here in Sacramento, California, where our headquarters is, and also where the temperature is over 100 degrees today. Ugh, but luckily I'm inside. Um, thanks for joining us for our August, or nope, not yet, July Take Action webinar. We do these webinars once a month, and this month's topic will be We the People National Lobby Month, which is next month in August. So I'm going to talk to you about um, all of the details for how you can get involved in that campaign. We're really excited to have you here. Let me mention right here at the beginning that um, this webinar is being recorded, and so uh, the recording as well as the slides will be sent to everyone who registered. So if you miss anything, don't worry. We'll send you an email tomorrow with um, the recording that you can catch up on. If you have to tune out early, that's okay. And um, we will have a quick survey at the end where we'll take your feedback and any additional questions that you have. And uh, we'd be happy to follow up with a phone call as well. Um, if you're having any difficulties, you can um, try uh, chatting them on, on the bottom left. And um, I will do my best, but it's sort of hard to do tech support while um, doing the presentation. So uh, if it's not something that I can help with, um, you could try contacting the support folks. Uh, that email is um, included right here on the slide. And again, the um, whole presentation is being recorded. So if you're having computer difficulties or something like that, um, then maybe best to, to catch the recording tomorrow. Um, the other thing is that uh, you can type your questions in the chat bar on the bottom left of your screen, but also there is a little question mark above the presentation, above the slides, um, which you can click and type your question there. So I'll check both places. As we go along, um, that question feature is new, so um, didn't account for it here. Um, so uh, feel free to type your questions along the way at any point that they come up. I'm probably going to save most of the questions till the end, though, so I don't have to click back and forth and um, can not interrupt myself. But I will go back to all the questions and catch up on them before we close. So um, feel free to type them as you think of them uh, so that you can get them out of your mind and um, go on to the next thing. So let's get started here. Um, the plan for this evening is I'm going to give a quick overview of Move to Amend because we have many new folks who are on the line. Welcome to all of you. Um, and then I'm going to talk about We the People Lobby Month, which is August, and some general lobbying tips, and then how to get started in the campaign. And then I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about We the People Lobby Month. And if there's time, I can answer general questions about Move to Amend as well. And then we'll talk about next steps. So let's dive in. Um, as I'm sure most of you are pretty aware already, Move to Amend is a coalition of hundreds of organizations and hundreds of thousands of individuals that um, are committed to social and economic justice, ending corporate rule, and building a vibrant democracy that is genuinely accountable to the people, not corporate interests. So that's our mission. And our goals are to pass the We the People Amendment, um, which is introduced in Congress, and I'll talk more about that a little bit later. And the We the People Amendment um, makes clear that artificial entities do not have constitutional rights, that only human beings have constitutional rights, and that money is not speech. So that spending money in the political process is not protected by the First Amendment. It's actually not a constitutional right. And uh, therefore, government can regulate campaign spending at any level. So that's what our amendment says. And that's our number one goal. But almost just as importantly, um, is our secondary goal um, that is kind of the bigger picture. Um, our intention is to provoke discussion and organizing around how to make real the promise of American democracy through constitutional renewal. So we have this campaign to pass the We the People Amendment, but we see this as part of a bigger um, effort to make democracy real in the United States, which for many people it never has been, and we're sort of moving further and further away from that goal. Uh, it seems, with every passing year. So we see the amendment as a key um, step 
towards the goal of real democracy, but it is not the only step. And so that's not the only thing that we do, although we do pretty much zero in on the amendment right now. Our principles and values um, are some of what sets us apart from some of the other amendment groups and some of the other kind of campaign finance groups out there. We don't really consider ourselves a campaign finance um, reform organization. We're focused on uh, democracy and ending corporate rule. So some of the, um, the principles that we kind of work from and values that we um, operate under are a principle of anti-oppression and solidarity organizing. So what we mean by that is that um, you know, this country in many ways has, has never been a democracy for all. And um, there has been a steady uh, um, course of events that have tried to move us in that direction by people's movements ever since the founding um, that kind of set up a system that was not democratic with the Constitution that only applied to a small percentage of, of the population. Um, and if you look at these successful people's movements that have moved forward an agenda of social justice and that really um, codified everything that we think of um, collectively, you know, pretty much any of us, whenever we think of the Constitution and the best parts of it, we're thinking of the amendments. So that's the work of, of these uh, people's movements. And really, so much of those have been led by people who are on the front lines of um, the harm caused by the fact that we, we don't really have a democratic system. So whether we're talking about the abolitionist movement or the um, movement for uh, suffrage and women's rights. Um, and then today, uh, the people who are most impacted by corporate rules uh, tend to be, you know, those who are people of color, uh, low income people, young people, older people, um, LGBTQ people, uh, immigrants. Folks who are uh, kind of the most marginalized and most threatened are actually the ones who are sort of moving forward the social justice agenda. And so we need to take direction from those folks and trust that their experience kind of living in um, this situation of a lack of democracy is genuine and can help inform uh, where we need to go. And so uh, part of how we do that is through solidarity organizing, working with folks who are working on the symptoms of, of a system of corporate rule and a broken democracy. Um, so uh, that's kind of our number one principle. And we do our work through coalition and movement building. The only way that the Constitution has ever been amended before is through people's movements. And so that's what will be required again in order to amend the Constitution. And um, it doesn't really matter if we can get, you know, almost everyone agreeing with us, which incidentally is the case on the idea that corporations shouldn't have constitutional rights and that we should get big money out of politics. We actually need an organized people's movement to make it happen, to force Congress to listen, to force our legislators to respond, uh, to elect people to office who will move our agenda, et cetera. And so, um, that is done through um, coalitions with other organizations, through movement building, and at its root is grassroots organizing. Uh, and by that, we mean, you know, building power. Um, so uh, that's why Move to Amend is structured around local affiliate um, groups, chapters. Uh, if, you know, some groups call them chapters, we call them affiliates. And that's where the rubber meets the road, really, in terms of what Move to Amend does is, um, you know, local organizing all over the country through our affiliates. And, and we're very intentionally set up that way because we believe that that's the way that um, effective movements are built. We also have a dedication to political education because, again, looking at past movements, um, one, we need to know kind of how we got into the situation, learn from the lessons that came before us, but also every successful movement has had a dedication to political education, to sort of peeling back the layers of the current situation to understand better um, the systemic problems um, that you know, we're dealing with that are kind of behind uh, the issues that we're responding to, and also um, kind of what the alternatives and other solutions might be. So, you know, that's why Move to Amend is not just a campaign to overturn Citizens United, because if you look at Citizens United and, and kind of know the history, actually, that case wouldn't have been possible if there hadn't been other cases that came before it in the 1970s, making with the Supreme Court, um, you know, making the argument that money is speech, and then going back all the way to the late 1800s, 
where the Supreme Court um, kind of found corporations in the Constitution by um, by agreeing that they had 14th Amendment protections. And so we, we don't want to just um, propose Band-Aids to these giant problems. We actually need real solutions. And uh, lastly, Move to Amend is committed to keeping our own political and economic independence. So we're not um, associated with any political party. There are um, numerous people involved with political parties who are involved with Move to Amend, but we're not you know, part of a party ourselves. We're um, nonpartisan or transpartisan. And also economic independence. We don't get our money from large corporations. We don't get our money from large foundations because we um, want to make sure that we are independent to do what needs to be done and not be beholden to anyone. So our donors are individuals uh, for the overwhelming majority. The average donation is $40. We're really proud of that. This is a grassroots campaign, and we're committed to staying that because that's the only way that we can um, ensure that uh, we don't get sort of co-opted along the way. And so... Um, Sorry, one second here. My slide is taking a minute. Let's talk for a second about how to amend the Constitution just to make sure that we're um, all remembering that because it's pretty key to what we're doing. So there's two ways under the Constitution to amend it. The first is uh, through Congress. So two-thirds of both houses uh, of Congress, the House and the Senate, um, must pass an amendment resolution. And then three-quarters of the states must ratify it. So that's 38 states. The other way has not been done before, but it is um, named in the Constitution as a, as a way to amend it, which would be that uh, two-thirds of state legislatures call for a convention to propose an amendment or amendment, so that's 34 states, and then three-quarters of the states still must ratify anything that would come from a constitutional convention, sometimes called an Article V convention or a convention of the states. All of those things mean the same thing. So... Um, I'm not going to get into this in too much detail, but move to amend's position is, well, if you look at what's required for both of these to be successful, it would require a massive people's movement. We're not going to be able to convince Congress without a massively organized and effective people's movement, and there's no way we could pull off a constitutional convention, especially not one that moves us forward in terms of our commitment to social justice and not backwards if we do not have an organized democracy movement in the United States. And so our work right now is to build a movement that would be able to uh, take either of these options and be successful. And so we don't pick one or the other. We are currently um, working more of our energy on the Congress piece because that's also kind of the principle of you have to take people where they are at, just a or general organizing principle. And most Americans are familiar with amending the Constitution through Congress. And there are, you know, questions about a constitutional convention. And so, you know, we, we feel, well, we need to give Congress a shot, but we also need to be willing to keep option two on the table because what if Congress refuses to ever respond? Uh, you know, that, that could be the end of our campaign, and that's unacceptable. So we have to have plan B um, um, on the table, and that's the constitutional convention. So that's the way we approach it. And... Um, we find that most folks um, feel pretty good about that option, and there are some people who, you know, prefer one or the other, and that and that's fine. There's good arguments for both, and good arguments kind of against both. And um, and in the meantime, though, if we don't build a people's movement, we're not going to be able to exercise either option anyway. So that's what we need to get to work doing. So our strategy is. Um, while we do have our amendment in Congress, not really to focus mostly on Congress. Our strategy is to primarily target the American public. Now, this webinar that we're talking about is talking about, you know, some efforts that we're doing to, to focus on Congress. But, you know, we don't have just like a team of, you know, elite citizen lobbyists or, or staffers who are doing these lobbying um, meetings. We're making it, again, kind of like everything we do, a grassroots effort um, because having a, a populace that is trained in, in lobbying and effective um, Advocacy for our amendment is going to be important every step of the way, no matter kind of which, which piece we're working on. Um, and most of the work that we do is education work right now on targeting the American public. 
So if you look on our website, you can see a lot of the other campaigns that we're working on besides the lobbying efforts, and, and, and that becomes real clear. We also do a lot of coalition building, reaching out to other organizations, working on issues affected by corporate power. And again, we really try to um, marginalize those um, relationships with folks who are um, most marginalized, most affected by corporate rule, and ha kind of have the most to teach us about um, you know, where we don't want to go and the solutions that we need. Building a broad and diverse multiracial and intergenerational movement, reaching out to those most affected by corporate rules. So as I said, that's kind of where we focus our coalition building and also being really intentional that in this country that is extremely segregated, in this um, time that is extremely segregated around age, um, in terms of you know workplaces and technology access and where people communicate with each other, it's really different depending on kind of what generations we're in. And then um, you know most of our communities are incredibly um, racially and class segregated, and so we actually make need to make intentional efforts to build bridges with folks who are different than us. And that's true kind of of everyone. Otherwise, we don't even have the opportunity to, to have those conversations. So that's actually something that's intentionally built into our organizing because otherwise it wouldn't happen. And it requires training and uh, learning and education in order to do that effectively because uh, trust is broken in a lot of places for lots of good reasons. And so to transcend that, it actually requires um, becoming an effective uh, change agent. That, and part of that is being able to communicate effectively and build relationships with folks who are who are different than us and so that's part of the teaching that we do for our leaders community organizing not just activism so nothing wrong with activism but in this case we focus on organizing because that's really about building power and and that comes through relationships and so yeah you know we we use facebook and social media but um if this campaign is just about a an online petition and how many clicks we get that is not building a people's movement and so um, where the most of the work that we do is in local communities around building resolution campaigns and um, other efforts that are uh, focused where people actually live and can can communicate and work with each other in person and and there's certainly an aspect that um, social media plays but that needs to complement the actual face-to-face -face organizing that we're doing not substitute for it and uh, to that end, we focus on grassroots organizing to pass local and state resolutions calling for the amendment. And so we've passed over 700 resolutions across the country in municipalities all over and a number of different states as well. And um, this is, you know, kind of the way that we show the power um, and growth of our, of our movement, that people are demanding that their Congress members respond and move the amendment forward. So that's kind of our, our primary um, uh, campaign strategy. So just so folks know how we're structured to kind of do all this, we have at the grassroots level our Move to Amend affiliates. Those are our chapters. Um, and then we have also We the People Amendment Working Group. So that's for folks who are maybe not quite, you know, maybe they don't have a critical mass to be a, an affiliate yet. Um, or maybe they're connected with another organization and so they do other work too and not just focus on Move to Amend. So those are what the working groups are for. So both operate all over the country. And um, then uh, at the national level, we have our national board and staff. That's our national leadership team. We have national committees that are kind of where um, a lot of the uh, different subjects of work get done. Those are actually available for uh, anyone to apply to join. So um, you can find that on our website in the About section. And then we also have um, issue or sector caucuses. So we have a labor caucus for folks involved with organized labor. We have an arts and culture caucus for artists. We have an interfaith caucus for people of faith and um, from ethical communities, and then we also have kind of information, a student caucus, and an educators caucus. So if you fit any of those um, kind of uh, areas, uh, feel free to mention that in your follow-up on the survey, and we'd be happy to plug you into those places as well. Okay, I'm seeing a couple messages from people who are um, seem to not be here with us. 
and I'm not sure what that's about. So what I'm going to do is actually turn it so that um, others can see those chats. And let me also just send a message to everyone. Um, if you can't hear me, it doesn't really help to say, but I think the problem is maybe that folks need to refresh, and I'm not sure why that would be. It should just happen automatically, but um, it seems like a couple folks are having trouble, so hopefully that chat will help send them in the right direction. All right, so let's get to what we wanted to talk about tonight and focus in on. Um, so. August is We the People National Lobby Month. And the reason why is because um, Congress is in recess and available to meet with their constituents during the month of August. Traditionally, um, you know, they also go on vacation, but they also do district meetings. And so we have dubbed August We the People Lobby Month to move forward the We the People Amendment um, during next month. So our affiliates will be visiting district and Senate offices in their states. And this is a wonderful opportunity for all of you who are new to plug in with Move to Amend and begin working with us because you can organize district meetings and Senate meetings as well. And then we will also be rallying all Move to Amend supporters to call um, Senate and House offices uh, that we're visiting all month long so that they're getting not just an in-person meeting but calls from constituents to really kind of elevate this issue um, onto uh, their radar. Um, so uh, you can, in a minimum, make calls to your representative, but my hope is that after I've um, kind of spelled this all out to you, that you will all join us in um, setting up meetings and, uh, and, and sitting down with your representative and or their staffers uh, in person. So um, Move to Amend has a 10-year strategic plan, and you can see it online at movetoamend.org slash plan. And there are you know, a number of different goals for 2017, but the ones that relate to this topic are um, as follows. So first, our goal was to get the amendment reintroduced in the House of Representatives because every new Congress, the amendment needs to be reintroduced. So that's checked off because we did that on January 30th. 2017, our lead sponsor, Rick Nolan, reintroduced the amendment. Then um, our goal was to get 35 co-sponsors in the House by the December 2017. So our, this is the third Congress that our amendment has been introduced in, and uh, we ended last year with 24 co-sponsors. Our goal was 25, so we came just short, and our goal for the end of this year was 35, and we kind of have a steady um, pace. And uh, certainly, if we can go faster, then we could get the amendment done faster than in 10 years. But when you look at um, kind of the lay of the land in Washington, D.C. and in state legislatures, actually 10 years is, is pretty ambitious. And if you're thinking, oh, my God, we need this amendment yesterday, I agree with you. And yet the conditions of our democracy are so dire that I don't see this happening overnight. And that's just the reality um, and something that we actually have to really be real about and come to terms with if we're going to be successful. So, so that's how we approach it. Um, so uh, our goal was 35 by the end of this year. And um, as of today, we're at 44. So we have met this goal. And now we want to continue to blow it out of the water. So it's not like we're going to leave House members alone. But um, we uh, are in good shape in this department, at least for our goal for this year. And then um, our third goal, we haven't met yet. So we want to get the amendment introduced in the Senate this year. And this is the first year that we're really trying for the Senate. It's, it's in the strategic plan for this year, and that's why. And we'd like five initial um, co-sponsors. However, we'll take any that we can get. Um, so that's kind of a two-part goal. First is to get it introduced with at least one. And if we can have four others, that will be um, what we, where we really want to be. So um, we will be focusing you know, a good bit um, in terms of our national attention on Congress, on the Senate. But um, I don't want to uh, steer you in that direction. If you think that your House uh, member is a good target, then you should absolutely um, meet with them as well. 
So let's talk for a second about the purposes of lobbying, just so we're clear. Sometimes that is a dirty word, and you know it's because corporations have really uh, hijacked the um, political process and the ability for us to speak with our um, representatives. And so a lot of people uh, don't like lobbying, and that's you know, kind of fair in some ways under the current situation. However, um, these folks actually work for us, and so it is important that we not just throw the baby out with the bathwater, um, but we actually participate in um, in building relationships with them and holding them accountable and not leaving that just to those with all the money. So um, the... I see your comment, Travis, about not calling yourself a lobbyist, and that's fine. Um, we're not asking any of you to call yourself a lobbyist in, in many ways. You know, citizen activist uh, is, is actually probably a, a better way to go about it, and that is totally fine. But we are going to be lobbying. So um, the purposes are to educate our elected official or officials, if, if we're meeting with multiple ones over the course of the month, about our issue, to identify whether she or he is a supporter an opponent or undecided, and that's really useful information for move to amend to have. So you're out to kind of do reconnaissance to find that out um, by asking where they stand. And then to move supporters to become champions, meaning that they actually become co-sponsors or they introduce the bill in the Senate, or if they're undecided, to become a supporter. And if possible, also to soften or neutralize an opponent. So maybe you wouldn't even be able to convince them um, on the, you know, ideology of, of what we're about. I'm thinking of like Ted Cruz, you know, who's actually stood on the Senate floor and waxed on and on and on about how great Citizens United is. Probably we're not going to convince Ted Cruz. However, even folks who feel as strongly as he does that we should not pass the We the People Amendment, can we help convince them that move to amend is big enough and effective enough that it's not in their best interest to be an active or vocal opponent, that maybe they could just keep their mouths closed and they can have their opinion, but not turn it into a big issue. So no matter where your representative falls on the spectrum of supporter, undecided, or opponent, there's, there, is, um, there is work to do with them to, one, get more information, first find out you know, where they do stand, and then two, try to move them in the right direction. So that's the task at hand whenever we're lobbying or doing citizen advocacy with our elected officials. So um, the U.S. House of Representatives uh, are, already have we, the We the People Amendment introduced. So our ask of them is to ask them to co-sponsor House Joint Resolution 48. That one's pretty easy. Um, you know, they can look to the bill, they can speak with Nolan's office, who's our lead, uh, and um, that's, a, that's a more straightforward, easy ask. But it's really important that we get this in front of senators. So our senators, the ask is to ask them to introduce a companion bill. We want the exact same language, which is often how they do things, and we definitely will sort of be running awry if they want to introduce something that's slightly different. So it's really important that we're clear that that's not really on the table. We want the exact same language as in the House um, introduced in the Senate. And I don't expect you to necessarily be able to absorb this, but if you go to movetoamend.org slash amendment and then click on the link to see the most current list of co-sponsors, you can also see this. Um, in order by, uh, you can kind of sort it in different ways. So you can see state or you can see, um, you know, name or whatever. Um, but this is the list of the current co-sponsors in the house. And so I will leave it here for a little bit so that you can quickly look and see if yours is on there. And if yours is already on there, then what we would be looking for is for you to have a meeting with one or both of your senators. And if your representative is not on there, then by all means, um, they could be who you target. Um, but also, we're looking for folks to have meetings with senators, too. So that's the current list. And I saw that somebody asked if any of those were uh, Republicans. So there is one Republican and 43 um, Democrats. And then this list is kind of uh, on here. I kind of 
wasn't sure if I wanted to put it in here or not, but I decided to go ahead and, and be transparent. Um, but I don't want you to think that if your senator is not on this list, that means that it's not really important that you meet with them. So what this list is, is our top priority senators. These are the senators that move to them and national staff have already met with this year and begun the conversation. And these folks are a priority because either they are in a state where we have already done a lot of on-the-ground organizing and we can kind of point to a lot of support from their constituents. Um, or they have expressed, um, they have said things either while campaigning or, um, or in the Senate um, that say to us that they are kind of sympathetic with, um, with what we're trying to do. So in particular, the, top, the two at the top, John Tester from Montana and Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island, um, they are both senators who, who have said that they don't believe corporations should have the rights that people have. Um, Sheldon Whitehouse said that uh, during the Gorsuch hearings. John Tester um, has introduced an amendment that says that and has, has also said that a couple different times. Um, so that... Um, so in some ways, they're actually kind of our most likely candidates. So if you or anyone you know is from either of those states, it would be really important for us to make sure that meetings happen with them on the ground. And then the other folks are all from places where we've done a lot of work on the ground. And I actually should have probably added, even though we, we haven't met with them because the meetings just didn't come together, but both of the senators from Washington state would fit that as well. And, um, and actually, both of the uh, senators from Colorado would make sense, too, um, because like Washington, um, uh, we passed a ballot initiative in Colorado um, in 2012, and so there's kind of on the record um, uh, a mandate for the Colorado senators. That's true in California, so Feinstein could be on there as well, but her... <laughs> Her politics don't tend to be very helpful. So um, obviously we need to get, you know, a lot more than just these senators, but we're focusing in the beginning on um, folks who are willing to step forward as, as kind of champions of this issue to show their leadership. So that doesn't mean, again, if you um, live in a state where you have a conservative senator or maybe one where you have no idea what they think, that you shouldn't meet with them. Um, you you kind of never know, as has proven to be the case from some of these House members who have come on um, that we weren't didn't really see coming, but um, but they you know had a conversation with a constituent so, and, and got some calls and, and responded. So uh, don't I see a lot of you saying you know that your senators aren't on here, and that doesn't really mean anything other than that there's a bit of work to do to kind of introduce this issue to them in the first place, and you might be the first ones um, having the conversation. But no matter what, our intention is to follow up with everybody, if possible, who does get a meeting in August in September when we will be in D.C. doing meetings um, I'll be in, in, in D.C., and uh, there might be some other folks with me as well um, doing meetings to kind of follow up. So um, this list will grow, and we will have a, lo a longer list of priority senators. So um, that's kind of the, the current situation. Um, and I should say uh, real quick, going back to these senators also, when we did meet, I met with each of their offices along with some volunteers in the beginning of June. So they've been talked to recently as well. Um, so uh, they, are, they are already primed. And if you live in any of those states, it's really important um, that we have those meetings with them. And, and more than one, if, you, you know, if we have folks in different parts of the state, uh, then we should shoot for having multiple meetings. And they might try to kind of put us all together in one lump, but we actually want to show that, you know, nope, nope, you have constituents all over your state who want to have these meetings, and so you might need to meet with us more than once. Um, so what we'll offer, what we have to offer you in terms of uh, resources for helping with this, we've got talking points. We have um, educational information that you can leave with your legislators, like a packet of, of, of background that we've found to be effective and persuasive. 
We can provide you with a list of the names of the petition signers in your district or your state if you're meeting with senators. So that's everyone who has signed the Move to Amend petition calling on their Congress members to, to pass um, this amendment. And that is actually a very compelling and persuasive thing. You know, in California, you know, we drop almost 60,000 signatures down when we meet with Kamala Harris and say, you know, here. Uh, this is, these are all the Californians who, who want to see this amendment happen, who are all voters um, and may or may not vote for you, depending on where you come on this. So um, we can put that together for you. We need a little bit of time to do that. So that's not a good thing to ask us for like the night before your meeting, but we have a process for you to um, let us know ahead of time that you'll need that. And we can also connect you with others in your state. So it's really important, and I'll talk later about how you kind of sign up. And we'll be sending this to our email list too, so anybody who wasn't here for this webinar will still get the opportunity to sign up. And then if you're from the same state or district, we will connect you with others so that you're not alone if there are other people who could join you. You can hold these meetings um, if it's just you. And if that turns out to be the case, uh, I'd ask you to please go ahead with it. But if there is anyone else in your state, um, we will connect you. And you can certainly recruit your own friends as well and encourage you to try to do that. And then any troubleshooting and support we are happy to provide uh, along the way. So if you're not sure what to do or if you need some coaching over the phone or um, you know, you're having trouble landing the meeting, we'd be happy to talk you through what you can try next. So what you'll want to do to prepare is you want to decide who, will, who you're going to target. So um, if your house member is already a co-sponsor, um, I would say, you know, this could, if you've got extra time, then you could meet with them and ask for, uh, tell them thank you and ask for additional support. And that might look like um, a statement uh, that we could use to um, kind of uh, make a case to their colleagues or that put out there publicly. They might want to say something really eloquent and persuasive about why this amendment needs to happen. It might be to do a giant town meeting at some point on this topic. Um, it might be to recruit uh, their colleagues to become co-sponsors as well. So just solidifying that support. Again, we're trying to take them from being supporters to champions. You know, And even some of the folks who have already come on as co-sponsors, I wouldn't call them really champions yet. Um, so they might need a little bit uh, of push in that direction and to show that we've got their back if they're willing to step up more. So that's one option. Uh, another option would be new House members. So if your um, representative is not currently a co-sponsor, this is for you. So you're educating them about the issue, which they may honestly understand very little about, and then asking them to become a co-sponsor. And um, we would have all the materials for that. And that's how we've gotten the 44 that we have now. So this is proven to, to work. And then for senators, we're educating and asking them to introduce a companion bill. And, um, you know, the Senate is, there's a reason why we started with the House and also why the House was easier to get. So um, the uh, Senate um, is, you know, they're less interested in introducing, they, they introduce less resolutions on the whole. They are more wary of things that aren't going to pass right away. Um, they're more just kind of conservative about stepping out. Um, and so they, you know, need more persuading. And when we met with those senators, the number one question they all asked is, well, what did everybody else say? You know, because they don't really like to do stuff alone. Um, so they're going to need um, some cover. They're going to need some education. And they're going to need some prodding. And so, again, since this is the one goal that we haven't, met yet for this year, this really is a priority on senators. And, and if you can meet with both of them, even better. So you want to decide who you're going to target. Then you want to schedule the meetings. And we've got um, a script you can use to make the phone call. Um, if, you're, if you really can't find who it is that you're supposed to talk to, we can help you get that information. Um, and uh, we also have a follow-up email that you can send. And you're probably going to have to ask a couple times. They don't normally respond immediately. Um, uh, 
Douglas asks, please send the educational info and the list of petition signers to those of us on the call now automatically. Actually, we don't we don't provide our names unless we're sure that folks are actually kind of moving forward. Um, but the materials are all already up online, and I will tell you where that is. So the educational info is, is all available and ready to go for you. Um, so you want to schedule the meetings, and then you want to do a little bit of research on your representatives. So um, you know, we, we can offer you some insight on how to do that so you're not just endlessly searching the Internet. But if you don't know anything about them, if this isn't something you've done before, it is a good idea to get a little bit of background. Are, are they a co-sponsor on one of the other um, amendments that are out there that don't adequately address the problem of corporate rule and money in politics, but you know, maybe move in the right direction, and they might be confused and not sure what the differences are. So being prepared to speak to that, and we have materials that can help you with that. Um, are they, you know, are are they really in with uh, large corporations? And is, you know, that's something that you need to be prepared for um, them to, you know, be defensive about. Are they connected with, um, and do they have the support of <clears throat> Particular organizations in your state, in your community, labor unions, um, or or community organizations, or social justice organizations, um, or business associations that maybe are local businesses that actually would be, you know, not completely opposed to to this uh, amendment. So, you know, could you do some work to get support from any of those groups ahead of time? A letter going in. Maybe there are um, organizations you know, labor unions that already have endorsed uh, Move to Amend that you could pull together um, in, a, in a list to add a supplemental information. So just getting, you, you do not have to know everything, but getting a little bit of background. And we do have some materials already up on our site to kind of point you in the right direction for how you can, can find that out. Um, and then a list of endorsing organizations in your district you already, I already mentioned, and, and I can help you, we can help you um, find where you can get that. So before the meeting, you want to get familiar with the talking points which we provide you. You want to practice telling your story, and you want it to be personal. Why do you support the We the People Amendment? Why are you on this webinar right now? Why did you sign the Move to Amend petition? What is it that um, has brought you to this campaign? And um, just practicing being able to tell that quickly and easily uh, and, and speaking you know, from your own experience because that's what's going to be most effective. And then, like I said, doing a little bit of research on your representative so that you're not walking in cold if there's some context that would be helpful for you to have. If you never lobbied before, just a few things that are pretty much common sense, but, but um, that you know, we want to make sure you know so that you're not feeling like a fish out of water. So you want to dress appropriately, so not the best place to wear your jeans, sandals, flip-flops, or T-shirts. You don't have to wear you know, a, a full suit, but um, I would recommend you know, dressing up a bit uh, if you, if you um, can do that in a way that is comfortable enough for you. Um, and you know, that just sort of uh, meets them at their level and shows your seriousness. Um, be prepared that you might end up meeting with a legislative assistant so, or a staffer. So um, the representatives are in district and you know, at home. They do have a lot that they're doing at home as well, and so uh, they might not be available, and um, it's still really important to go ahead and have the meeting. In fact, almost no representative uh, knows what they want to do on an issue without consulting their staff. So convincing their staff is actually going to be critical along the way no matter what. So if you end up meeting with a staff person and the representative isn't there, that is completely um, a success and you know not something to feel as though you didn't meet, meet what you needed to do. But just be prepared for that. Don't be surprised if that ends up happening and sometimes at the last minute. You want to stay on topic. You're probably not going to have very much time, 15, 20 minutes. So you know you can chat, chit chat a little bit, but don't lose track of time and realize that you know they're kind of getting up to leave and you haven't even really made the ask or the pitch. You want to solicit their views on the issue. So whether you're meeting with a staffer or the legislator themselves, you want to you you want to make the pitch uh, for why the amendment, but you also want to ask questions so that you can find out um, you know where they stand. Because remember, you're doing reconnaissance and gathering information for us. 
um, collectively. And so uh, you want to find out where they stand and don't let them off the hook. Make sure that they give you some actual information um, about what they're thinking. And then when you conclude the meeting, you want to leave the packet of information. You want to leave your contact information. If you have a card or can kind of make cards just for this that you just print off on your printer, that's a good idea. And then offer to be a resource for them, whether or not they're willing to come on as a co-sponsor right away. Um, make yourself available that if they have follow-up questions or just questions on issues that relate to this topic for the future, that they know that you're somebody that they can call. And then we ask you to take a picture, especially if you're with a group, um, but even if it's just you, take a picture with the representative or their staffer, whoever you met with, ask, ask for a picture. And um, don't make statements that assume that others share your political views. So best to stay on topic with just move to amend and not necessarily go off on other political issues or um, if you're in a different political party than the folks you're talking to, uh, not, you know, really go into that, but just, um, you know, keep it as I'm a constituent and, you know, uh, I'm here to tell you about an important issue that you need to understand. And don't, don't escalate it into a conflict. Um, you know, most of the time these meetings stay cordial and that's all fine. Even if they're, you know, not interested, uh, keep it respectful and polite and there may be other forums where it would be um, where you can kind of come back <laughs> to any concerns you have about stuff that was raised and, um, and make sure others know about it. But this isn't really the right forum for that. Again, gathering information. And then we have a report form that you want to use um, in person so you can take notes while you're there. And if you have multiple people, assigning one person to kind of be the primary note taker is a great idea. But if not, making sure you take those notes right afterwards so you remember everything that was said. And then we have a report form online where that goes straight into our database. And so we would ask you to take that report form that you filled out in person while you were there and then get it up um, online so that it would be available for others in the future if they're meeting with that representative and for national to know. And then you send a thank you letter as soon as you get home is a good idea. Just pop it in the mail and we'll give you a template for that. And then you want to follow up by telephone and email in early September because, again, we're going to be meeting with our DC staff in, in September. And so if you could follow up before that, that's ideal. Um, so. Uh, I, since I see, uh, Delphine, that you're, um, Delphine is one of our super awesome uh, Sacramento Move to Amend folks and also one of our office interns. So if you wouldn't mind posting this link for people, uh, so if they want to click over to there right now, they can. All the materials that I said are available are up on this page, so you can get them and get started right now. So you want to familiarize yourself with those. You want to schedule your meetings. You want to recruit some friends to join you, and again, um, you want to make sure to do the first thing that's on this web page, which is sign up and say, yes, you're going to participate. Um, and then uh, you're going to um, – and then we can let you know if there are others in your state or in your district who want to join you. But either way, it would be great for you to recruit some friends so that you're um, not solo. And then let us know what your plans are. So basically, once your meeting lands, there's another form for you to fill out. And if you're doing multiple meetings, you just fill it out multiple times. You know, I'm meeting with Senator such and such on August 2nd, and I'm meeting with Representative XYZ on August 17th or whatever. And you fill in the details. And just keep us in the loop so that we know, so that we can prepare um, the list for you, and uh, so that we can follow up and find out how it went. Jim is asking a good question going back to the previous slide. Uh, what do you mean by follow up? So good question, Jim. So what that means is they're not going to tell you in that in-person meeting 9.9 um, .9 .9 times out of 10 that yes, they will co-sponsor or yes, they will introduce the amendment. They're going to tell you, we'll think about it, we'll talk it over. If you're not meeting with a the representative, then absolutely they will say, you know, well, I got to talk to my boss. So you're going to get, you know, kind of something inconclusive most likely. Um, you may get something inconclusive that feels positive, and you may get something inconclusive that feels like extremely unlikely. So that's all details that we want to know, like if it felt optimistic or not. But um, the follow-up is to ask, you know, if they have any additional questions, 
and um, if they have a response, if they're ready to come on as a co-sponsor or, um, or, or introduce. And um, it probably won't make sense when you, you know, follow up by telephone and then uh, also again by, um, uh, by uh, email so that um, you can, um, you know, CC on, us on that as well. And I see folks are, um, Delphine might not quite know where that page is since I um, went away from it, and I see Bill asking for it. So if you all just give me one second here, I can actually post it in the comments so that it's clickable. Here we go. Um, so that's the page that you want to get all the details from. So so hopefully that answers your your question, Jim, about the follow-up, and, um, and again, we can kind of help with that. So um, now we're ready for any questions. Thanks for those of you who have asked them along the way. I think I've been able to kind of keep an eye on chat and see those. Let me check in the questions area. So again, to type questions, you can either put them um, in the chat uh, just at the bottom left of your screen, or you can um, click the little question mark and um, ask your questions there. So first, let's take um, any questions about We the People Lobby Month and kind of anything you're wondering about how to get started, how to make it happen, what you would need to do. And then um, if there's time, I'll also look at um, individual or questions that are more uh, just general about Move to Amend. Um, let's see if I can read and talk at the same time. Okay. Most of these things I'm seeing are more more bigger questions about move to amend. Um, so if you have a question about lobby month, make sure you get it in there. And I'll get started on these ones that I've already got here. So um, Janice asks, is it possible to find out what businesses have lobbyists in Congress so consumers can better determine how to something. <laughs> um, I'm guessing support uh, um, or not. So there are lots of places we, where you can find that info. Janice, one suggestion I have, a good resource just off the top of my head is Open Secrets. And I just posted a link to that um, in the comments um, in the chat. So Open Secrets Lobby um, is a good place where you can see kind of uh, where folks spend lobbying money and kind of what the lobbying firms are and who their clients are and all of that. So that's what I would suggest. Let's see. Douglas says, here in Nebraska we have a nonpartisan legislative body that has recently manipulated to amend ballot access for non-party designated candidates to collect twice as many 10% of signatures. Um, so this was never asked for by the We the People Election Commission. Tells us a referendum has to be passed and change it to a fair requirement. All right. So this is not an issue uh, question related really to an amendment. This is more like a campaign um, and democracy related question. It's a good question. Um, but I would suggest, Douglas, uh, that maybe giving our office a call to talk to somebody about this would be the best way because I would need to kind of look up Nebraska and also uh, probably have a longer conversation. Um, and it's particular to just your state. And I don't know that there's anyone else here from ne Nebraska. So that is something that happens to basically um, every time uh, alternative or independent political parties or candidates are able to kind of get close to getting access, then the two uh, major parties are commonly will collude to um, make the process even harder to get ballot access. And that is very common and really unfortunate and um, a sign of our lack of democracy. So feel free to give us a call and let's talk about it. And uh, we'll see if there's anything we can do in terms of advice. Isn't the ending of corporate personhood a partisan issue? You guys only have one more sponsor Republican so far. How we get around that by Travis? Um, so I would say it's actually not a partisan issue, Travis, uh, because if you look at polling of uh, the American public, 
eighty percent um, support the idea that corporations should not have the same rights as people, and that is, you know, really close. You know, it, conservatives, it's like seventy something support that seventy something, seventy five something like that percent support as well. So that's um, the case. We've passed our resolution in numerous uh, communities that are conservative. So I hear, I see your follow-up. I mean, you mean among legislators? Well, I, I mean, yeah, but that's sort of the point, right? Is that uh, the Republican Party is not really following through on the um, will of their rank-and-file folks in a number of ways, and, and you know, and the Democratic Party doesn't really either. Um, but the most effective way to kind of the only way that that's going to be turned around is if Republicans are actually willing to kind of hold their their party members accountable. So that's why we focus more on actually educating conservatives that are not necessarily legislators at this time, because that feels like uh, there's a lot more room for traction there. And the reality is that um, at the state level, we have found conservative lawmakers who are who are sympathetic but they're not willing to necessarily publicly get out there on it because of where their party stands so you're right that that is a one of the hurdles um, in our path and um, and there's sort of a similar but um, equally problematic one, actually, that um, stands before us in terms of uh, the Democratic Party, a sort of like lip service without actually following through. Um, so, you know, again, kind of going back to our principles and sort of how we operate, um, we have, uh, you know, a focus that we, you know, we put more on the public to kind of bring them along. We do have a document of conservative talking points for conservatives, and I would encourage you to work off of that if your representatives are conservative. And um, I think we have some compelling cases that you can make. And um, and again, you know, you might be more at this current moment not able to secure a champion, but rather moving somebody who's an opponent into more neutral zone, or or um, or at least willing to say some, make some comments you know, even if they're not willing to co-sponsor um, about how the system is corrupt and we actually re need to look at it. And um, so that is what I would suggest to you, and we would be happy to talk to you about it in more detail if you want, um, kind of as you get started, once you have a chance to look at those talking points that we, we have provided that might help. Um, how would a limited Article 5 convention move us backward? Congress is really too entrenched to really get this done, in my opinion. Yeah, I hear you, Travis. I think... Um, the question is whether a limited Article 5 convention could happen, you know, and, and really what would happen with an Article 5 convention since there's no legal direction to speak of um, is, uh, is all up to where's the political power lie? Who has the political power at that moment that a convention happens or to force a convention? And at this time, the folks with more political power who, who want a convention are, um, you know, kind of the much more conservative, kind of for lack of a better word, forces, corporate forces, really. Um, I mean, the Koch brothers are, you know, financing a lot of the push for the balanced budget. And um, I just, I, and, and there are many others who wouldn't trust that that's not also going to be an attempt to um, attack uh, people of color, LGBTQ folks, women, immigrants, um, because if a convention happens, it will become a place to move forward political agendas. And that may or may not be successful, and there may be, you know, a pushback to make it limited, but that's not guaranteed. So that's, that's how all of that could become very messy and move us backwards, and uh, that's what we need to guard against and make sure we're prepared for. And I know that there's lots of legal analysis on the matter saying it can be limited, but again, since the Constitution doesn't say it would be, that's all up to do you have the power to enforce it or not. And if you don't, then anything is possible. And if you do, then what you want is possible. And that's, that's really the question. So that's why 
anybody who wants an Article 5 convention should be helping to build a people's movement that could actually be powerful enough to make sure that that's successful in all the ways that that would need to happen. Um, let's see, what's the legal validity of a state determining that an elected position to be partisan and then using that determination to calculate the requirements for issues and the like? I'm guessing that this is related to your other question, Douglas. So again, maybe it would be better for us to talk about that offline. Um, I'm not quite sure what that means, so I'm going to keep going. Okay, Joan doesn't have a chat, tech, doesn't have a chat box. Hmm, I'm not sure what that's about. might be your browser, but it looks like you got your question in here. So if you have anything you want to say, Joan, feel free to stick it in the questions area. And Roger, it looks like your question got ro cut off, so feel free to ask it again. And it looks like that's all the questions we've got so far. So I see that there's been some conversation here on the side. Some people have answered them. So um, I don't want to be redundant here, but let me just skim through there. There's also been comments, which is fine. Are there articles differentiating the other amendments? Yeah, Bill answered this. But um, if you go to movetoamend.org slash um, other hyphen amendments, uh, let me put it in here. Um, that is where you can see uh, a quick and easy to memorize and or print out and use um, kind of uh, comparison between what our amendment does and what the other amendments do or do not do, kind of where they fall short and why we don't support those. Um, so, yep, that will be helpful to you if your representative um, or senator is a co-sponsor of one of the other amendment bills. So I encourage you to look that over. Um, let's see. And then Jackie asks, what impact will this amendment have on organized labor unions? Will they be affected in the same manner as corporations? If so, this could be part of the pitch to GOP members of Congress. Yeah, so Jackie, um, because our amendment says that, um, and, and intentionally so, that um, only human beings have constitutional rights and that artificial entities do not. That means that any entity or organization created by government or sanctioned, you know, brought into existence by government um, does not have inherent constitutional protections. So that would include labor unions as well. So that is a point that oftentimes is important to conservatives, that it be applied equally to unions too. And um, for folks who, you know, are part of unions who might get all worried about that, a couple things. Um, it's the only kind of ethically consistent way to approach it um, because uh, the whole point is that we have constitutional rights, not because the Constitution says, but because those are human rights that are inalienable, whether they come from, you know, God, if we believe in God, or just the fact that we are are uh, alive, sentient beings. And so, um, you know, the Constitution just codifies those. That's not where we get them from. So our rights don't come from government. And therefore, since government creates uh, organizations, government doesn't actually have the authority to give corporations or unions or, or any entity, uh, you know, human rights. However, there are, there is a place for government to give rights under the law to artificial entities, and that's statutorily. Um, and that's something that's kind of up to the political process. So after the amendment passes, we could decide, well, since corporations serve one function in our society right now, they are, you know, exist to make a profit. Um, and that's sort of an inherent built-in push that they have, and unions exist to advocate for workers' rights, they're entirely different organizations. And so one might have a role in the political process and one might not. And that would be a question that would be up for political debate and ultimately decided um, by the democratic process. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that after the amendment passes, corporations wouldn't have any role in politics. I don't think they should, but that would be up to the political process. 
Same thing with unions um, and other ways that we might draw distinctions or maybe nonprofit corporations are different than for-profit corporations. And, and all of that is doable, um, but not if any one of those entities has constitutional rights because then it's basically off the table for government to, um, whether it's at state, federal, or you know, local level, to uh, put regulations on them that, that are interpreted to violate their rights. So all that is maybe a bit more complicated than what you might get into with folks, but it's the kind of thing where maybe if they have questions in the meeting, um, around this and you're not totally sure of the answer, you can take down the questions and there's a place on the form for you to say um, what their questions were and then we'll help you make sure to get them answered. So there are materials on our site that actually speak to everything I just said, articles that you could pass on that they could read um, to, get, to get the more detailed uh, answers. And so um, thanks for, for asking that. Uh, Jackie, because I had meant to mention that, that if anybody is not able to answer a question in the moment, that's totally fine because um, part of what you're going to do is just say, that's a great question, I will get the answer, and I will follow up with you, and then we'll work with you to make sure that you have the what you need to, to do, do just that. Let's see, Cindy, hi Cindy, says, um, Washington State is having a statewide call for the 28th Amendment. After this call, we will work on getting appointments with our senators. We will also keep working on getting more representatives on as well. That is awesome. So happy to hear that. And I sent you an email this morning, Cindy, that um, I'm hoping we can have a meeting soon. So looking forward to that and really excited that the Washington folks are going to participate. And let's see, are your conservative talking points on your website? Yep, if you go to the... Um, Let's see if I can do this really quickly. Uh, they're actually part of the packet on, aren't they? Let me check and make sure. Yep. Actually, if you go to the page, the We the People lobby page, in the lobby packet, um, they are one of the items that are there. They're also in our toolkit. Um, but uh, they're right there, and I will also post them right here. Okay. And then is there a guide to delineate amendment differences, Jill asked. So again, Jill, that is um, that link that I provided earlier, the other amendments link, uh, posting it again here, just to make it easy. OK, great. Thanks, Cindy. OK, so last call for any additional questions. Otherwise, we're going to um, close out here soon. It looks like those were all just folks commenting on the discussion we were having, which is great. All right, so let me turn that off. Okay, so if you do have any additional questions, you want to put them in the chat because I did turn the Q&A off. Um, all right, so next steps. So there's a survey that will pop up when I close out this webinar automatically in your browser. If you could please fill that out. Um, and that just gives us feedback on how, how this experience was for you and any suggestions you have for future webinars. You also can indicate there if you would like a phone call from us to follow up with you if you have questions that you didn't get to ask or that are still outstanding. After you're done filling out that survey, that's going to take you to the, um, to see the page that we've been giving you the, that says at the top, um, We the People Lobby 2017. And um, the first step is to click to sign up. So we are asking you to kind of fill out two things. One is the survey with feedback on how this webinar went for you. And then the second, which you don't have to do immediately, but we would love you to do as soon as possible, is to let us know that, yes, you are going to participate in We the People lobby. You may not know who you're going to meet with yet. You may not be 100% sure you're going to be able to. But if you're even a little bit thinking that you want to, then it would be great if you could sign up. Um, on the We the People lobby page that you'll be taken to after you do the survey. And um, let us know, because that's how we can start to connect folks who live in the same district and state. And then um, on that same page is all the materials that I referenced, so you can read them over. We've got the amendment language, frequently asked questions, talking points in general, talking points specifically for conservatives. Um, we have the amendment comparison is, is listed on that page, 
and then also an article about why it's important that we abolish all corporate constitutional rights, not just the First Amendment and um, money in politics. So that w it will all be good background to give you a good um, sense of kind of what you want to say to make your pitch. And then you want to get started scheduling your meeting. And we've got a phone script and a sample email to follow up. We've got tips for when you're at the meeting and um, then details about what you want to do afterwards and, and also the materials that you want to take with you, the lobby packet stuff. is all up on that website as well as some additional info about lobbying um, in more detail if you've never done it before. So everything is there and um, we uh, will be happy to answer any follow-up questions that you've got about any of it. So basically the next step is just to complete the survey. That will take you to the right page if you're not already there on our site and then to fill out that you want to participate and then we will follow up with you. And if you have questions in the meantime, we are always available by uh, email or phone number which are listed there on your screen. And we don't actually have a topic for our August webinar yet, um, but you can always find um, – thanks, Travis, for posting. That's the sign-up form if, uh, if you know you want to get started. Um, so we don't know our uh, August webinar topic, but you can always find it on the um, webinars page. So that's our webinar tonight. Thank you so much to all of you who are here. Again, this was recorded, and we will send you the recording video as well as the slides uh, tomorrow. And if there are any questions that we didn't answer, you can put those in the survey. So thanks again, everyone. Really looking forward to working with you for August. Let's definitely make it so that they feel the fire of Move to Amend. Um, and that they can't ignore us. So please you know, recruit your friends. If you've got friends in other states, um, please ask them to join as well. It's uh, definitely not too late. Happy to have you, um, you know, step forward at any time, even, even once we get into August. Um, so thanks again, everybody. Good night, and you will be hearing from us soon. Don't close your browser. It will take you straight to uh, the survey as soon as I close out here. So goodbye, everybody.